Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Three days after they found his body, I had a fucking dream. We were in the yard. I was like, ah, oh, Benny, I'm sorry, man, I fucked up. About 20 feet down, I fucking, I came to, but I just couldn't, I couldn't get to the surface. But it's fine, man, I'm fine, like, it's good. He's like, you, you'll be fine, I'll be here. This place is sacred. It's holy. And he knew that. Welcome to Martha's Vineyard. I always tell people it's an island, but you probably know that already. We're the third largest island on the east coast of the United States. We're the largest that's not attached by a bridge. Everyone was young then, the man thinks, as he walks along a path with his own son now. He does not carry a gun does not need it as his pastime is hunting ghosts. December is a good month for this, the holiday season conjuring up all manner of ancestors. They wave at him from up ahead, as does his father, appearing again as a young man. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Pekovich, and this is episode number 411. Available now on digital is Somewhere With No Bridges, a documentary that explores the life of a New England fisherman who tragically passed away in 1999 through the words of the family and friends who loved him. A moving and lyrical ode to one man's life that explores themes of grief, memory and community. Somewhere with No Bridges also marks a feature film debut of director Charles Frank, who I'm glad to say joins me now on the podcast. Charles, I thank you so very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So just reading up about that, this film, like originally, you know, just to clarify as well, just for people out there. So the, the man who we're talking about in the movie is uh, Richie Medeiros, and he's like a, a distant cousin of yours. From what I understand, um, your mum is Richie's cousin. So it's kind of like a third cousin kind of thing. Is that correct? Yeah, it's actually my father. Your father. Um, well, yeah, it's my father's um, first cousin, and they were sort of raised like brothers. I mean, he was kind of he was kind of an uncle to me, but formally, yeah, a, a distant cousin. But kind of the island community uh, at that time when my dad was growing up there with him was very um, close knit, and so they were kind of like raised like brothers. The original idea for this documentary, though, had nothing really to do with. Richie's life per se, but it had to do with just the community of Martha's Vineyard. You were out there, you were shooting, and then the transition kind of happened. How did that transition happen where you were focusing on one type of more kind of like a free-flowing documentary to more of a focus kind of narrative point uh, that we see now in, in, in on digital? Yeah, so um, that's totally right. Like in the beginning phases of the film, we were kind of had this loose idea that maybe it was about um, the ebb and flow of tourism on the island and kind of looking at the year-round population that lives and works there 
Um, and you know, a lot of my family, uh, lives on the island year round and works on the island year round. So that was an interesting focus point for me. Um, but what I found was over and over again, when we were spending time with the locals, Richie would just come up. I wasn't even, um, searching for him in, in everyone's, uh, I wasn't really even searching for him, but he would just come up and people would share stories and, um, and, and, you know, be full of, of, of joy and life. Um, and so it kind of just happened naturally that that became, and he became our focus. He sort of presented himself. Um, and, and, you know, it, in the process, of course, it made me think about my own perception of Richie as this person, almost mythic type figure in my life. Um, and, and it made me more curious to explore that and, and hone in on that as our kind of main narrative focus point. So the, by the time you're doing these documentaries, I think it's already, what, 2019? It's 20 years on from Richie's passing. I'd imagine, though, it's still a delicate situation considering the tiny community and, the, and your family as well. You're dealing with themes of death and grieving. So you transition over, and that means having your family on camera to talk about Richie and everything else. What are those initial conversations like? Were your family open to the idea of it? Was there scepticism about it? How did it all kind of, you know... How did you feel out the situation, so to speak? Yeah, well, um, I was very nervous about it. Um, in many ways, I was afraid that I was sort of poking at something that um, maybe I shouldn't be, um, or or that you know wasn't it wasn't maybe my place to, um, and that you know grief is a very personal experience, I think. And so for me to sort of dig that up and ask of people to share was a big ask. And I was really anxious about it. Um, so we spent probably almost two years filming before we even did an interview. Mm. Um, and what we were looking for was sort of Richie on the island, his presence on the island, even beyond the story. It's just the, the feeling of him uh, and, and, you know, the, the people that he left, the everyday routines of the people he left behind and um, the other fishermen that he used to fish with, we'd just follow them around and be with their everyday lives. And that felt appropriate um, and comfortable for me that we could sort of experience his presence through that sort of everyday routine. And then when I built some relationships with both family members and friends of Richie's, um, I started making that, the request of like, hey, can we talk about this? Um, and for some people, it was an immediate like, hell yeah, like, you know, I'd love to share a story about Richie. Um, I even put an ad in the paper about it, which is the opening scene of the film. And I got a lot of excited uh, responses from that ad. Um, but then there were some people that, you know, really took time to come around to the idea of sitting across from me with these lights and cameras. And it just was a foreign concept. And, and a lot of people said that they hadn't really fully processed or spoken about it with anyone until this moment. So it was a, a range of things, um, but I definitely felt the weight of that throughout production. The big theme, I think, from the movie is um, memory, um, how people deal with them, how people, you know, personify them, how to describe them. Um, memory for you is very important because you said in your film you were five years old. Your first memory is when you were five years old. It was specifically about Richie. What was it about the, that memory about Richie? I think it had to do with the time of his death as well. What was it about that moment in life that really struck you? Because I imagine being five years old, you really didn't know your cousin that well considering your age. But I guess at the moment it would have been what the environment or the reactions of your parents and, and family. Is that kind of what really kind of stuck in your head all this time? Yeah, that's exactly it. Um I think it was mostly the way, the feeling, the tense feeling in the air and the way that I saw my father react to it. Hmm. Um, I think, you know, when you're that age and something really traumatic happens like that, um, I don't know if I had the understanding to process or, you know, or, or I don't think I fully grasped what was happening, but I could feel that something serious was happening. Um, and I was sort of along for the ride, I guess. Um, and it's taken me a long time to realize, you know, that that feeling I was picking up on um, was extremely powerful and, you know, is still felt on the island today. 
Um, and so maybe I didn't process or understand it fully at the time, but it definitely left a mark, um, which is really what that, I think what ultimately drew me to Richie and drew me to, to making this film is just wanting to explore that feeling that sort of um, started this whole journey um, and that everyone that knew Richie holds on to um, is sort of the trauma and shock, but also the, um, the legacy he left and the power of that. Um, yeah. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by 80s Tees. 80s Tees is an online retailer of licensed t-shirts and pop culture gear from your favorite movies, TV shows, cartoons, video games, comic books, and musicians. Celebrate your inner 80s nerd and click on the link in the show notes below to get the raddest retro t-shirts delivered to your door. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Loot Crate. Founded in 2012, Loot Crate is the worldwide leader in fan subscription boxes. Loot Crate partners with industry leaders in entertainment, gaming, sports, and pop culture to deliver monthly themed crates, produce interactive experiences in digital content, and film original video productions. No matter what you geek out about, Loot Crate has a subscription box for you. To get your very own exclusive collectibles, apparel, and gear delivered to your door, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is also brought to you by Voodoo. Watch the latest movies and TV shows anytime, anywhere. No subscriptions, no contract. Enjoy stunning quality in up to 4K ultra high definition at home and download and watch on your mobile device as well. To rent and buy from over 100,000 titles or watch thousands of movies free with Voodoo Movies on us, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. Now, back to the show. You know, what I love about the movie is that you have the narration, you have the testimonials, you have also the, the footage and the photographs of Richie when he was a younger man and in times, the earlier times of your family. I love going through our old family albums, old photos. It's something about those old photos that, you know, I think we kind of take for granted having kind of like these devices and everything because we can scroll through and we can store as much stuff we want. Those old photos, to me, they're kind of like rare jewels. It took a while, it took a while for those photos to be taken, to be developed. You know, you're waiting for weeks. I don't know how old you are. I'm 41. So I remember the time my parents used to go to, like, you know, the, the pharmacist or what have you to wait forever to get the photos done two weeks or so. And then you get it. It's like a, a big thing. You, with you yourself, when you were going through those photos, do you have kind of the same approach to them as well? Do you appreciate what they are, not only in regards to the context of the memories that they hold, but the process of making these things? It took time. It took money. And it's something that I think we kind of uh, take for granted these days. I love that, um, that you brought that up because that was actually a big motivation that, that exact fact was, it was a big motivation. We shot a lot of the film on 16 millimeter film, mm. um, which <clears throat> we had collected our cinematographer, Jeff Melanson who's also the composer. Um, he's a huge, uh, you know, loves shooting on film, that sort of, um, tactile textural feeling of it. And, and the process of it um, sort of forces you to slow down and think about what you want to capture and appreciate what you're capturing and then wait to see what you got. And it becomes a little bit more cherished because of that. And we chose to shoot on film um, for that reason. It helped us focus a little bit on what was most important. Um, and, and yeah, I definitely think that, that those old photographs um, they hold a little bit more weight. They're not, um, there's not, there's a finite amount of them. Um, and, and, uh, I was scanning the originals, um, for the movie. So it felt heavy for me to be touching them and, and knowing that this is the only copy there is, and I'm, I'm going to try to preserve it and put it in this movie. So yeah, it definitely, they held that kind of special weight. Um, and actually even, uh, that idea also is sort of what inspired the scene in the movie where we, we watch um, um, a photographer developing a photo that he took of Richie. Um, and we're watching the photo actually develop in real time. Um, it was sort of about that feeling you're describing and yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. Anyway. It's kind of like bringing back the memories of the past back to the present, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. almost like almost like like a, like a sorcery or alchemy or something to it. Uh, yeah. it's, it seems so kind of far away now. It really is. You know, um, I don't know if you noticed, but over the last few years, there's been a lot of movies based in New England. Um, I've I know I've reviewed them. I've interviewed the filmmakers. Um, as I've interviewed the filmmakers, we talk about you know New England as such, and they bring up you know how they try to kind of catch the authentic air of the of the of the places where they're filming. Um, and I go along with it. What do I know? I'm here in Sydney. I'm, I'm going to take them for their word, only to get feedback from people from the area saying they didn't really capture what it's like there. They have no idea, really. So tell me, you know, your family's from there. You spent a lot of time there working on this documentary. What is it like there in New, New England, especially in that part of, of Martha's Vineyard? Because from what I can tell, it's become maybe much a tourist attraction, hasn't it? Kind of like almost like a playground for the rich uh, to kind of go down there and, and do their thing. But what's it like in there, like boots on the ground, kind of like, you know, since you've got ties there? Um, explain it to me as, a, as an outsider. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that was originally what the, the the kind of focus of the film was, is sort of that um, the year-round working class community that's, that's on the island um, underneath that sort of layer of tourism, um, uh, that's there. Um, and even me as someone that was born and raised in New England, um, coming to the island, I, you know, I, I visited the island in the summers, and um, but I didn't live there year round. So mm. even me coming to the island, um, I was viewed as an outsider. I am viewed as an outsider. Right. Um, and so even within the New England community, the island community is another sort of layer of a close knit sort of um, somewhat guarded, um, definitely emotionally guarded uh, group of, of folks that, you know, have a lot of pride in the work that they do um, in, and, and are skeptical of, of outsiders coming in and trying to, you know, poke at their and, and look at their world. Um, I think that if it hadn't been for my connection to Richie, I wouldn't have been allowed in the way that everyone did allow me in, right. even just being able to film the softball games, you know, the men's adult league softball games or go out on a boat fishing with the local. Um, those things were, you know, if it hadn't been for my connection to Richie, I don't think that I would have been allowed to do that. It's sort of like, that's their, that's their, their world. And, and um, they, they kind of, take pride in it and, and don't love outsiders kind of trying to take a glimpse in. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that, yeah, there's sort of this, um, you know, New Englanders can be a little cold uh, <laughs> and, and hard to access and um, not, not the first people to share how they feel about things, which is part of what made me know how much power Richie had mm. um, in that they're in their willingness to share how they felt. I mean, you're a lot of people that you're talking to, whether it be your family or Richie's friends, they work, they are fishermen. Um, it's a marina town that the fishermen are very much the main kind of like export of, of things that they do down there. Um, we're talking about very kind of old school hard men as well. Um, then try and, trying to get them to open up and talk about Richie and express themselves. Um, is it as difficult as it sounds or is it just a, a, a thing of just having the opportunity uh, for them to do so because I imagine you know maybe you know from myself I'll be working on stereotype and I imagine people wouldn't want to even try to you know I wouldn't even try to broach the subject but for yourself as an insider so to speak you know I know you classify yourself as an outsider but you do have family ties there I imagine they even with an in like that you could try to you know get some emotions uh, revealed to the surface and maybe someone else wouldn't yeah well, I think the thing is, it, 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 I think it's a fair amount of skepticism to outsiders, but sort of once you're, you're in, there's obviously very sweet, kind, loving, beautiful people. Um, and I don't think that I did anything special to, um, to sort of stir up an emotional response. I think I was just the right person at the right time mm. to, to, to be present. And I think that I allowed 
for a conversation to happen. I provided a space that felt as comfortable as I could make it, given that there's lights and a camera. Um, but, you know, I'm a family member. Um, I was asking the question. I was asking for to, to hear what he was like because I was genuinely curious. It was something that I missed out on getting to know him. And I spent my life hearing about him. And so I genuinely wanted to just hear who was this guy that was obviously so special to so many people. And I think he's the one that allowed them to go there and made them want to go there. Um, I think it's just, I provided the opportunity for them to, to do it. Um, but I don't think it was any like tricky interview tactics or special skill that I had as a filmmaker, to be honest. The thing I take from this film, from yourself as a, both a filmmaker and, and, and the cousin of Richie is that it seems like um, you're kind of like an advocate for him, for the outside world. Um, watching the film, to me, the, 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 the kind of like the vibe that I get from Richie is that he's like a, a good man, a family man, a loyal man, a hardworking man. Um, and that's a really cool thing to, to, to get to know someone even 20 years after their death. I imagine for yourself and for your family, there could be a sense of pride in that because I think you should be proud for, for what you did there. Oh, well, that's really sweet. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I spent so many months um, being very anxious about the film and how everyone was going to feel about it and um and did I did I go too far? Was it my place to dig about this? Um, but overwhelmingly, people from the community, um, family members, have just been so um, supportive and overjoyed by the film. And and um, you know, I've just shared that it feels like his legacy in in some way will continue to sort of reverb, you know, echo out into the world. Um, and I, I yeah, I, I'm proud of that. And my family is, seems to be pretty proud of that. Um, and, and I think, you know, my hope is that um, the movie can sort of help others know Richie, but also think to somebody in their life that um, maybe they feel distant from or, or maybe they want to learn about or maybe they want to um uh, get to know whether they're still here or not. Um, it's sort of my hope that the film can spark that in some way. I think it will. I think you did a really good job. And for everyone out there listening, Somewhere With No Bridges are available now on streaming. So you've got Apple TV, iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo. Um, you can check it out at those places. I really recommend people watch this film. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed talking to you today, Charles, and I've really enjoyed your film very much. I think it's a very kind of, uh, it's a movie that, that a lot of people can, you know, attach themselves to in their own ways through their life experiences. And I think at the end of the day, that's what every filmmaker wants to do. So congratulations to you and uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.